Good morning from Los Angeles. Thank you to everyone for joining this webinar. As um, I'm the Nina Hachigian, I'm the Special Representative for City and State Diplomacy at the U.S. Department of State. My small but mighty new team leads and coordinates the State Department's engagement with mayors, governors, and other local officials in the United States and around the world. We are here to ensure that as we carry out our foreign policy and diplomacy overseas, we are bringing the tangible benefits of this work to local communities. And one major benefit that we seek to increase is foreign direct investment. I understand from firsthand experience how FDI is a key priority for our cities and states and counties. One of the best days uh, I had on the job uh, when I was deputy mayor um, for international affairs in Los Angeles was when I learned that VinFast, a Vietnamese electric car company, which is now building a factory in North Carolina, was going to set up its North American headquarters in LA. The feeling of bringing jobs to your residents just really can't be beat. But I also learned what hard work it is. It took a combined coordinated effort of the city, the county, the state of California and the Department of Commerce to pull it off. Uh, and my office at the Department of State didn't exist by then um, or back then, but I was in touch with our embassy in Hanoi as well. Now we do exist uh, and we really want to help. At the federal level, promoting FDI is a collaborative effort with the, our Department of Commerce colleagues. We have 200, over 200 overseas embassies, about 75 uh, of which are staffed by members of the Foreign Commercial Service and the others with um, uh, Department of State officials. So through these officers, foreign direct investment or trade opportunities are shared and Select USA processes these opportunities. These officers also coordinate with our Bureau of Economic and Business Affairs, providing the foreign market knowledge that makes its way to helping your cities and states. Our team is also able to help provide consular support. Companies facing challenges with visas can connect through us or directly with our consular affairs team to resolve any business visa related questions. Whether through helping with business visas get processed timely or connecting your teams to new foreign opportunities, we are an available resource. But the real experts on local foreign direct investment are the local leaders. So we thought we would bring them together uh, to share best practices that help some of our, to answer the question of what helps our uh, cities and states thrive when it comes to FDI. This conversation wouldn't have been possible without the help of the Truman Center for National Policy. So Max and your team, thank you to the Truman Center for co-hosting and for your shared interest uh, with us on city and state diplomacy in general. And thank you very much to the panelists for taking the time out of I know what are very busy days to share your expertise. We are now going to hear um, our keynote from Kansas City Mayor Quentin Lucas on what his city has done on foreign direct investment. We hope this discussion brings useful new insights. And if other questions remain, we are here at State. Um, our commerce colleagues and the Truman experts are, are always here to help. So thank you so much. Hi, I'm Kansas City Mayor Quentin Lucas. I'm proud to speak with you about Kansas City's success attracting foreign direct investment and our recent development progress. Thank you, Ambassador, the Department of State, and the Truman Center for organizing this panel. I'm excited to be a part of the inaugural cohort of mayors of mid-sized cities engaging with the Department of State's subnational diplomacy efforts and look forward to the opportunities that this network will bring to cities throughout our country. While most people know Kansas City for our world champion chiefs and world famous barbecue, most do not know that we are developing an important center for trade and commerce. Kansas City is one of the nation's largest hubs for warehousing, distribution, and manufacturing operations, ranking number two in the Midwest and number four in the nation for containerized imports. The greater Kansas City area is also home to one of the largest foreign trade zones in the United States, which handles more volume than those in Chicago or Dallas. We're an emerging center for foreign investment. Canadian Pacific recently acquired Kansas City Southern for $31 billion. This merger will create the first single line service connecting North America. And our metro is seeing huge investments from abroad. Panasonic building a $4 billion electric vehicle battery plant, which will be a critical component in our nation's fight against climate change. Kansas City has been successful in attracting international investment because we focused our attention and resources on developing our infrastructure with businesses and people in mind. 
We recently opened a $2 billion single terminal airport, which has already attracted new international flights that connect us to the world. Our city was also the first major city in the United States to offer fare free transit on buses and our fixed rail streetcar, which makes it easier for workers to access jobs, health care, and education. We've made historic investments in affordable housing, which keeps the cost of living low and makes this a welcome place for people to relocate. When firms make the decision to invest in our area, they consider the totality of the city's resources, business climate, and more. As mayor, my role is to help craft policies to make it attractive for investment, but also to promote the successes of those policies to those who know little about our region. For example, we'll be a host city for the World Cup in 2026, which is one of the largest events Kansas City's ever hosted, bringing fans from around the world to the heart of America. And I will note, we're the smallest market in North America to host one. In addition to hosting, we look forward to developing opportunities for business, relationships with organizations from around the world, and will be a showcase for America, our region, and our city to show businesses and individuals looking to invest in our future how welcome we are to all of them. The last component that's essential in attracting foreign investment is to make connections between our city officials, local business leaders, representatives of foreign governments, and all of you. I appreciate the discussion between our Chamber of Commerce and trade representatives from Mexico and Canada, and I look forward to being able to share some of our recent successes and to discuss ways that we can further connect our city with firms in Canada and Mexico. Conversations like these are essential to create a dialogue between institutions that share many of the same goals, but often do not have the opportunity to connect. Even with these successes, some challenges remain. There is a need for more engagement and coordination between our federal partners and the Department of State and the Department of Commerce with mid-sized cities like our own. Having connections with career officials with expertise on matters of trade and diplomacy is an asset local governments normally do not have access to. I thank you for listening, and I look forward to future collaborations between cities, the federal government, and our partner organizations. Thank you, Ambassador Hashigan and Mayor Lucas for your remarks. And thank you everyone for joining us. My name is Max Boucher. I am a visiting senior fellow at the Truman Center for National Policy, where I lead our city and state diplomacy project. This work aims to better understand the opportunities and challenges stemming from the international engagement of local actors. Last year, the Truman City and State Diplomacy Task Force found that there is a space for more US cities and states to engage their global counterparts and to enhance their capacity to benefit from international connections. We also explored the case that stronger ties between the local and national level is one way to ensure that diplomacy serves all Americans. After all, what cities and local actors do at the global, at the global level and their initiatives on economic development is what makes the United States competitive. And we are thrilled about this partnership with the US State Department. In his remarks, Mayor Lucas referred to a new network of mid-sized US cities. And we are seeing a wide range of communities seeking to enhance their international engagement to attract talent, to increase their position in global supply chains. All of this to bring good paying jobs at home. US cities, though, cannot rely on a business as usual approach to attract foreign investment. The pandemic shock of 2020 has led many American cities and states to redouble their efforts to attract foreign capital. What does it take? What are successful strategies? How can US cities and states develop better, more sophisticated, investment attraction strategies? What's the secret sauce? To answer these questions, we have an esteemed group of panelists. Deborah Schieber is a senior visiting, is a senior vice president for global and trade investment of One Columbus, the economic development organizations for the Columbus region in Ohio, where she's responsible for leading the region's worldwide marketing and business development efforts. Many of you in the audience will know Chris Knight, as Chris has been working in the field of foreign direct investment for over 16 years. Chris is a co-founder of WaveTech, which was a FDI consultancy advising government to promote their location globally. And today, Chris 
is the managing director of FDI Intelligence, which is part of the Financial Times. Shagun Idowu is the chief economic opportunity for the city of Boston. He was appointed by Mayor Wu in January 2022 to focus on making Boston's economy more resilient and more equitable to ensure that it creates opportunities for all communities. And last but not least, Dr. Femi Elekbede is acting director with the investment research team at Select USA within the International Trade Administration, which is part of the US Department of Commerce. Dr. Femi is leading research on global supply chains, clean tech, renewable energy, and we are so thrilled and grateful that all of you are joining us today. We will be taking questions. There is a Q&A function that you can use to submit these, and we'll keep some time at the end to uh, address these. All right, let's start with the basics. To some Americans, the value of international engagement by local actors may not always be intuitive, especially as the benefits of what you're doing at the national level might not be immediately visible. The debate is also often dominated by the ills of globalization. And so the time and resources that local leaders are dedicating to cultivate international relations, including travel, can sometimes invite scrutiny, especially when taxpayers' resources are involved. So let's go um, around the, the room. Can you share your pitch in, in one minute on how do you make the case for why going global matters to US cities? How do you communicate about the benefits of international engagement to city residents? And um, is it a hard case to make? Uh, Deb, let's start with you. Well, it, we communicate it differently depending on who the audience is. But if you know, if we're talking, <laughs> excuse me, to our city officials and and to um, our what I would say government or or not profit partners, we often talk about the economic uh, diversity that it brings to a region. We talk about the contributions in payroll from foreign direct investment. We talk about the the different perspectives and how um, you know companies that are coming from different countries bring an overall more competitiveness uh, to a region and the, the it's contributing back to our economy through the different perspectives, the growth in the companies and the employment that they they have for our citizens. Shigun, how about for you? How do you make the case for why going global matters to Boston? Well, um, first, I want to thank you and the ambassador uh, for this invitation uh, to be here for a really important conversation that I'm happy Boston's able to play a role in today. Um, you know, uh, I actually, it's funny that you asked this question because Boston actually doesn't need to make as hard of a case or as hard of a pitch because a quarter, uh, you know, one in four of our residents are foreign born, you know, 53% of our city are people of color. And actually, a couple of the members of our team, I see um, James and Donald and, and Yushi and Elijah, you know, we are actually getting inbound from residents who are saying, we want you to establish relationships with our home country uh, uh, in some uh, variation. And so for us, though, to this to the residents, it's all about, um, you know, it's exactly what, what Deborah was saying, is the economic impact on our city, uh, the jobs that are created, um, but also how the development of our residents allow them to help their families at home. One of the um, uh, biggest businesses in our neighborhoods are people who are creating credit unions in order to send money home to support their family members or their communities there. And so um, for us, you know, the, the pitch is rather easy. Uh, it's more so how our, our team is building the capacity to uh, take all that incoming uh, and translate it into um, uh, uh, effective partnerships uh, with, with communities around the world. Chris, your, your team released recently uh, like a major ranking and report on, on FDI in the US. From your perspective also, like how should you know, US local actors explain and communicate on the value of these uh, inward investment? Well, I think firstly, I, I agree with everything the speakers have said um, in terms of what, what is important. In, 
I thought about what you were saying, the importance of going global. And I'm like, wow, that's my whole career. What would I sum it down to in one minute? But I thought, if you look at the US, right, the world is changing. Historically, the United States has not had to worry about FDI the same way as, uh, so I'm Irish, the same way as my country has needed FDI. You've got investment from all throughout the United States. But now, as I say, that the world is changing because of the type of industries are changing. Right. So while the US is leading in tech and many of the other industries of the world, some of the hottest industries right now and some that I thought in high tech manufacturing, semiconductors and batteries, this are being led by foreign companies. So it's really important to be looking elsewhere. Also, I, I did a bit of thinking into the, the Inflation Reduction Act. Right. If we look at that, it's going to stimulate trillions of, of investment. But a lot of that is going to be FDI, because if you look at clean tech companies in the world, only 10% are from the United States. So that means to, to stimulate and to get this money, it's going to be looking at foreign investment. If we look beyond that in, in the world, you know, typically what, what your usual countries people look at, your Germany's, your Japan's, what they're doing in the United States is reinvestment. A lot of the domestic investment is reinvestment the new opportunities for greenfield investment are coming from emerging countries, places which five, 10 years ago, we weren't thinking about, they weren't on our radar. You know, if you look at the United Arab Emirates, their outward FDI has increased every single year for the past five years. They're now in the top 15 in, in terms of source markets. You know, India also, a lot of people are, are looking at the, the usual places, but we had an office in India and it is stimulating huge growth. So for me, the key, the key thing is actually looking at the industries and where are the source countries? And then we can move on and talk about how we promote that uh, moving forward. And Femi, from your perspective at the federal level, how do you, when you engage with local teams, how do you help them communicate or elevate the value of going global? And how does it fit as well in, uh, in the country's national investment strategy? Um, thank you very much, uh, Max. And um, so from the federal level, like at Select USA, and thank you for inviting us um, to be part of this. And all we do is FDI. So at, on the federal level, at Select USA, um, since we've been created like 11 years ago, we've had about like $146 billion that we facilitated in investments into the United States. That's led to about 166,000 US jobs. So you can imagine that it's, um, it would like behoove any city and state to like compete for some of these billions and that could like lead to jobs in their cities. So what do we do? How do we interact with cities and states? We help them out. We provide them with, with information, we provide them with research reports that can help them in terms of when they're pitching to some of these foreign clients to come to their states. So we always encourage all of our clients like, hey, reach out to us and then we can work with you and make sure that uh, we can like provide the right kind of information that you need to make your city competitive. We also connect our clients to like all the federal agencies you know, United States is incredibly massive. Um, you know, we're talking about like 50 US states um, and territories out there. We're talking about the, um, the US federal government. There's a lot going on. So we're here to like help people navigate and connect people to the right people to make sure that they're getting their voices heard. And that's what we're here for. Yeah, and we'll, we'll go back a bit more details in, in that connection and, and support that the federal level provides to, to local actors. But what's striking is you need this, uh, this focus on, on creating jobs, improving economic opportunity is, I think, what also makes uh, international engagement, the economic engagement, such a, a big entry point for many US local actors who are developing international strategies. So let's go a bit in, into the specifics. Uh, our project is called City and State Diplomacy, with a bit of a focus on, on government, but we're also, of course, mindful that beyond mayors and governors who are champions for their regions, building economic competitiveness and FDI strategies takes a village. And having looked at the case of Columbus, it's really striking how the one Columbus model is a great example of successful collaboration across stakeholders, between governments, the private sector, et cetera. And so Deb, it'd be great to hear from you. What can other cities and regions in the US learn from the one Columbus model in terms of how to organize for FDI attraction? Sure. Thanks, Max. Um, you know, we, we approach it from a multi-prong 
uh, standpoint. We, we think that it's really important to collaborate, that we're all moving, uh, at least understanding what each other is doing when it comes to city, region, state, um, our business leaders. And so we take some pretty um, measured approaches. We're meeting once a month with all of our local economic development organizations, um, our county organizations, really to talk about what's going on in the region. As a part of that, we frequently have the conversation about foreign direct investment, what's happening, which way, uh, you know, where our focus is. We certainly lay that strategy out annually at the beginning of the year. We're meeting quarterly with our state economic development partners, and that includes the other regions that are around the state to coordinate. Oftentimes, we'll do joint trips with our regional partners, um, along with our state partners, so we have a cohesive message when we go out to the market. And then oftentimes, when we're traveling into the markets on foreign direct investment mission trips, we're taking our partners with us, city, county, but we're also taking business leadership with us. Sometimes our business leaders are making appointments on our behalf with suppliers that they're working with that they'd like to see you know, in the region. And so we really try to take a collaborative, cohesive approach to um, working across all of those organizations uh, and stakeholders to make sure we're, we're all marching in the same, same path. And Shigun, uh, Boston ranked uh, in the, the recent uh, ranking that uh, the Financial Times and Nikkei uh, published on uh, US cities and um, in international investment, ranked at the fourth uh, place out of 100 US cities. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, Boston does not necessarily need to, to make that case, but, but still, what are successful initiatives um, that you are seeing you know, in your team and, and across Boston to uh, develop an investment strategy that again, keeps attracting from businesses. And also would like to, to hear you because it's such an important uh, uh, focus for my Wu. To what extent does this FDI strategy ties with the city's equity goal to ensure that um, these investments benefit all communities across Boston? Well, um, thank you for that. And, um, you know, we're, we're working hard to make sure we shoot up to number one. Uh, you know, Miami's got the sun over over there for 365 days. And while we can't replicate that, there are other ways we're going to try to make it to number one. But anyway, um, so uh, Boston uh, has not done it alone. I mean, Massachusetts is number one for the life science industry. Um, and we are attracting uh, so many folks who are coming here to try to figure out how to replicate it. I, I remember uh, last June, uh, Her Royal Highness Princess Astrid of Belgium and 80 of her ministers visited Boston. And I, I'm only recounting this because it was so cool. I had never met a princess before, but, um, uh, you know, came here to understand how Boston slash Massachusetts have done this. And it started uh, more than a decade ago under um, uh, the governorship of Deval Patrick, um, who, you know, he and his team had this vision of we are going to make Massachusetts number one in this industry. And but they also understood they could not do it alone as state government or just in partnership with the legislature. It took this, uh, the state of Massachusetts, it took the city of Boston, it took our, our partners in academia, it took our uh, partners in the private sector, all to come together and not only talk about how we're going to make it happen, but to make the required investments. And we're talking billions of dollars that the state invested, um, uh, in, and as well as the private sector, to ensure that we could not only harness uh, this industry, but be a place that, that helps it thrive. Um, and out of that came two really important quasi-state agencies. You have the Mass Life Science Center led by uh, Ken Turner uh, that's focused on providing uh, continued investments, helping life science companies find uh, uh, the perfect place uh, in Massachusetts. Um, and you've got uh, MassBio, which is the advocacy group uh, for all the life science companies here, not only making sure that uh, the policies that uh, the legislature is considering help to stimulate further growth, um, but also that we are looking at um, our practices, uh, how we're connecting talent uh, uh, to different opportunities 
opportunities. Uh, more recently, um, uh, in terms of this partnership, the mayor at Bio, uh, which is the largest um, gathering uh, of the industry, happened here in June um, at our convention center, and the mayor announced a new initiative uh, to help connect Bostonians to the life science industry, to help diversify the industry, but really looking at not just diversity on the racial level uh, and the gender level, but also um, in terms of the education level, you know, really kind of taking a scan of the industry and looking at, you know, do these particular jobs require a four-year bachelor's degree, or can you get a certificate from a community college, or um, uh, you know, go through a vocational school and and an apprenticeship and get a job? So, this partnership has helped to strengthen the industry um, and continues to make Boston um, uh, and and the rest of the Commonwealth um, attractive for companies to to make these investments and to move to to. Uh, you know, get further uh, uh, folks as part of their workforce, et cetera. But on the idea of um, how the mayor is focused on uh, building equity, um, great question. Uh, and I'm going to try not to take a politician's minute to answer this. Uh, and we'll say that um, one of the things that we did in uh, January of 22 uh, was to sit down with James and Yushi Aliyah Forrest, who's the director of business strategy. I saw Shanice here as well to think about how can we um, do global affairs a little differently. And uh, these kinds of kinds of conversations also were enhanced by working with folks like Mary Entema, who I see is here from World Boston, and thinking about how can Boston be more proactive. Um, and so when I think about the equity piece, part of it is who we're even building relationships with. For a long time, Boston has been reactive. I, I think I shared in the beginning where everyone wants to come here and build the relationships. But when we did a scan of who we have either sister city relationships with or um, you know deep partnerships with, a lot of them focus just on Europe or South Asia, not many on the continent of Africa, not very few, if any, uh, in uh, South America or the Caribbean. Um, and so uh, in terms of uh, at least even uh, creating more equitable conditions and who we're partnering with and reflecting the city that we live in, uh, we've begun these conversations and establishing uh, mutually beneficial partnerships with folks across the areas where we had very little, if any, relationships to ensure that we're not only creating opportunities for cultural exchange, but also uh, helping to build up the companies uh, here uh, that are Boston-based, but also how we're helping drive investment in companies uh, uh, in uh, uh, cities across the world that, uh, again, that we didn't have those relationships with. So that's just one aspect. But again, it comes back to the workforce, how we're connecting folks uh, to those opportunities, um, where we're driving investment, uh, etc. Michigan, this point about cities um, not being able to afford to be uh, reactive is such a, like a critical point. And in our conversation, we often hear that very few cities have a, a detailed, uh, um, proactive FDI strategy that prioritizes markets, uh, that uh, has a list of, again, priority by industries and by locations. And, and so for me, it'd be good to hear from you as you uh, work as well to help local actors be more proactive and to develop, to enhance their uh, foreign direct investment strategy. Can you share a bit you know, with, with, with us you know, examples of, of initiatives uh, and methods that US cities can use to, again, be better prepared and not just react to opportunities that might come in an ad hoc way, but again, uh, have a strategy that is uh, proactive and, and targeted. Yeah, so um, at Select USA, the incredible thing about Select USA is we're connected to about 75 global markets. So we, we have access to all of these markets and we talk to clients globally and then within the US, um, within the United States itself, we work with all 50 states and territories. And what we do is um, with, the, with the data that we have, because you know, we're under the Department of Commerce and we have tremendous amount of data. So the amount of data that we have is actually quite useful that we can use to you know, help you know, when we talk to some of the cities to tell them like, hey, this is what's going on. This, these are the trends that we're looking at. And they can engage with us to like, get better information about that. So not all cities, of course, um, have the financial capacity um, to like have like an FDI strategy or like have like a in-house FDI shop. So we provide the services for free. So if you if they contact us, we give you know with the with the resources that we have, we put it right behind um, right behind the research reports to provide most of the cities like the best and brightest information, so they can like make decisions and attract investments to their to their various cities. 
But one thing I want to highlight is the Select USS Summit. And then I know a lot of people um, are familiar with it. Um, we had about like 4,900 uh, attendees. Um, it's something that we host once a year. I would encourage cities to attend. And the reason why is this. You have an opportunity to interact with, uh, and the last time we had the summit was this year, we had about 83 international markets that came to, to Washington, um, to the Maryland area for the, for, the, for the conference. So as a city in the United States, you can come to this conference and you get to network with like 83 different international markets, different industries, different government agencies, and get your city out there and get um, the network in. And that's what we do. We create that platform for cities to like network and connect with other um, agencies, other cities to learn what they're doing, to also gain opportunities for them and to let other countries and clients know that they open for business. So we encourage cities to attend the, the, um, the Select Your Assist Summit. In addition to also contacting us for us to also assist you with FDI research and strategy. So those are the two things that I can highlight that I think is like incredibly useful to like cities. And Chris, on this point as well, uh, for you know, US cities developing more proactive strategy. Uh, can you also, as you sort of benchmarking, you know, locations and, and, and supporting local governments uh, promote themselves uh, intentionally, what is your sort of list of do's and don'ts, you know, when, when, uh, when the local government, you know, you know, you know, Boston or Columbus have already sort of sophisticated uh, approaches, but for maybe you know, local, smaller, mid-sized cities that uh, might not be already prepared to, to harness these connections? What, what advice would you share? It's a good question. And, and I do agree with what you and Femi said, you know, FDI, it isn't cheap, um, but you have to work out, do, do the rewards outweigh that. So in terms of the do's and don'ts, and, and I'll say this and when I say it's not cheap, but I've also worked with communities across Africa who are doing it. So it is also, if you do it right, you can do it affordable. So in terms of the do's, I think, touching on what Deb said, communities need to work together. You know, you're better together than apart. Your budget goes further when you're promoting a bigger region than just promoting a, a small region. I think consistency is key. You know, you get too many cities um, who, who opt to change focus maybe every two years. And, you know, Max, I think you mentioned at the start, FDI takes time. I think on average, it takes around three years from you first meet a company to they land. So if you're changing your focus, every three years, you're not going to get that benefit. Next, I think it, it, a, a do or a don't, we can say is a, don't think that you are good in every sector. You know, if you've too many sectors, it means you're not focused. So focus on what your key skills are, what the talent you've got, what the cluster you've got, then find the source markets for those and remain focused on it. So that's in terms of attracting the, the investment. And I've done quite a bit of that. But if you're looking at what can be done at lower cost? And, and that is much more on the retention of an expansion of what you already have, right? You should already know all of the foreign investments in your region. You should be proactively account managing these. That's where you're going to get the quick wins. Let's all be honest. It's, it's not quite as um, good a photo of, of, you know, cutting a ribbon of a new company, but it's effective. If you can expand a company by a hundred, a thousand people, what, what I would recommend is having a clear, a clear key account management strategy, identifying your foreign companies and tiering them, tier one, tier two, tier three, and have a different engagement with the different tiers, depending on, you know, how paramount is this investor to your community? That is, you know, if you look at countries like Spain, 70% of their FDI is reinvestment. So while that 30% is new, but that new takes a lot more effort you know, what this, they always say, it's easier to, to sell something to an existing customer than it is to find a new one. That works the same in the world of FDI. And so my, my two things are when you're looking to attract it, understand that it takes time, remain focused. It is a, a three to a five year focus. You know, if you're looking at Korea, don't change that focus. Be focused for that length of time. And then secondly, don't forget when the companies have landed, that's not when your job ends. You then look after them, you expand them, you embed them to your community. So they're, they're engaging with universities. So you know that they're locked in and they're not leaving. And that is much lower cost. So I think you can work on the cost and you, you can think what you're going to do, but you need a mixture of both of those things. These are really great points. And, and, and Deb, I mean, this again reminds me of, of lessons that we learned from, from one Columbus decided around a narrow focus on, on really distinctive assets that really 
makes the region different and as well as this focus on retention. And so from your perspective in, in one Columbus, how do these uh, like do's and don'ts resonate with you? Oh, I, I think Chris is spot on on that. And, you know, we often say it's hard to get the company to, to uh, put the facility here and, and choose your region, but it's ever most so much more important that once they're here to keep them here, keep them growing here. I mean, when, when we often look at um, pipeline numbers and such, in general, we like to see 60, 70% of our deal flow coming from expansions. Um, and, and that's really where uh, it's important that you maintain those relationships and that you're nurturing them as they're here. So that's part of our program. That's part of our our comprehensive program that we do as a regional organization is that business retention and expansion outreach. And they have another question about, about Columbus and that ties also with, with some uh, uh, findings from, from Chris. This idea that uh, US cities should project a, a unique distinctive uh, identity. Uh, be, often we notice that um, Many US cities are again projecting or promoting their region for the same, uh, sometimes vague um, industry specifications. And and Columbus, I mean, used to symbolize the American Rust Belt, but now is telling a very different story of of innovation, of growth. So, what can we learn from Columbus on how you are showcasing and and, and, and promoting the region to uh, foreign investors? Yeah, I think. I think, first of all, we take a pretty tr uh, tactical approach when we're looking at who our target um, attraction candidates would be. And, and then once, we, once we've engaged with them and we, we've set the table of, okay, let's really talk about why Columbus might be a right fit um, for a company, we really want and often, well, always take a look at what their angle is, what why Columbus could be an asset to them and really emphasize those unique points per each company because each company's priorities are gonna be different. How they're gonna fit in the market is different. They might all not always be a good match uh, with Columbus. So we wanna really focus on those ones that we feel like we really have a value proposition for um, and particularly with those unique assets and put those in front of the company. So we. We, um, we customize almost every approach that we do when we're having individual conversations with, with companies around the world. And, and this work about, uh, again, targeting foreign locations, developing partnerships takes time. And often, the outcome, and often the outcome, again, maybe five, 10 years uh, later. Um, so I just landed a company um, from the United Kingdom uh, happened at the end of last year that we began conversations with six years ago. Wow. And Shigun, we often hear that like foreign direct investment is about relationships. And, and you mentioned earlier that the city of Boston, I mean, it's very diverse, has deep industrial connections through its airport, diaspora, sister cities partnership. Can you give us a bit some color about how um, does Boston, again, leverage and harness these industrial connections to develop economic opportunity? Well, first, I want to say congratulations, Deb, on landing the, uh, <laughs> landing the deal. Um, you we know, did have a little party. We, we did a little <laughs> dance in our office when that happened. Very well deserved. Um, so, you know, when I think of... Um, uh, the story of Boston, uh, and and I think Sue about like I'll, I'll speak more generally and then talk about um, what we're doing here in Boston. You know, since I came into this this role, talking to lots of CEOs of companies that are both based in Massachusetts or elsewhere, and finding that in the post COVID world, the story that we have to tell is more about uh, what our communities are like and who makes up our communities versus. We've got great incentives and, you know, we have, you know, so much, uh, you know, we've got 26 universities and 100,000 plus students here to tap into, um, you know, because we're finding that it's not the CEOs that we have to convince, it's the workforce uh, who have to move to cities uh, uh, to help these companies grow. And so, you know, for us, it's telling the narrative of 
all 23 of our neighborhoods and who makes up those neighborhoods like wh what is the city that you're moving to it's the city that uh is focused on being the most family friendly in the country or focused on being uh the the city that's green and growing you know the the mayor has this initiative where we're at 700 uh, we're at 700,000 residents now we want to get to 800,000 where we were 50 years ago um you know how we are a city that delivers exceptional constituent services but really the most important piece uh, and what our work is focused on is how we're a city that's closing the racial wealth gap. And, you know, when we're promoting what the vision of our leadership is, not just, again, the city leadership, but again, I think of Governor Healy and her team um, uh, and our partners in the ac academic and private sector, um, you know, it, it's about how we are all connected in pushing that narrative uh, and that vision forward. Um, but again, it's focused on, uh, at least what we're doing here in Boston, is, again, showing the, the rich diversity of our city. We are not Ben Affleck's Boston anymore. Um, you know, we are not the Pac the car, you know, uh, uh, you know, population, but we have so much rich cultural heritage here that spans generations. It didn't just show up, uh, but we have always been a global hub uh, that has welcomed so many uh, uh, from from many different shores. And, um, you know, again, we're, we're making sure that that is reflected not just in our uh, government, but also uh, in so many other industries um, uh, and sectors here. In the city. So again, it's just about how we're promoting that diversity um, uh, and, and the quality of life changes that we're making here. And on this point about cultivating relationships, uh, um, Femi, Select USA and the Commerce Department, uh, as you mentioned earlier, do provide services, but also facilitates uh, introductions between US local actors and, and US embassies abroad and consulates. Can you maybe share a bit you know, from your perspective as well? How um, can uh, U.S. Like, local actors leverage these international connections? You know, their airport connections, gateway, diaspora, and, and what is the role of the federal government here as well to to support and, and facilitate these connections? Yeah, absolutely. We support everybody, um, the big and the small cities. Everybody is um, all supported under the U.S. federal government. And as I said earlier, like we are a platform for networking. And um, we, we do that and through the, through the summits and we just let people know that, hey, listen, you can come to the summit and, and network with people. In addition to that, we also have trade shows. Um, we also have trade shows that like regional people do like, and we have regional champions and regional champions like work with like different regions in the United States just to make sure that we're like tracking every city and state. So we have people that cover different uh, regions so that you know, they know that we're there and they, they know they're very, that they're supported. And then internationally, there are also shows that we also attend and we encourage, we also let our various cities and states and ADOs know that this is what's going on. We provide information through our um, listserv to let them know that this is, a, this is what's going on. Um, I think recently, like our executive director just got back from Italy. He had a road show there where he was um, telling some of the advantages of coming to the United States of America and cities um, join in, those, in some of those road shows. And then we have some events that we attend where uh, some cities come along, some states come along. So it's it's open for all and uh, the collaboration is there and we just encourage it. Mm. Deb, from, from your perspective, I mean, you are as well engaging and, and benefiting from the support from the federal level. What are sort of key like benefits that you are envisioning from again, a, like a stronger and closer collaboration between the local level and the federal level um, on this topic of economic competitiveness? Yeah, I think that, well, first of all, I couldn't agree more. I mean, we we have found that Select USA has been an unbelievable resource um, that we've utilized over, over the years. We had a huge uh, deal that we discovered through the first Select USA um, event that ever happened. Um, and that company um, has uh, recently announced an additional expansion. They've been, I think they have now about 1.5 million square feet in the market. So it's, yeah. it's been uh, a great partnership. Um, I'll say that we look, everything we do, we, we're looking through the lens of how is it going to help with our FDI engagement? How do we adapt it? as markets adapts, as players adapt, and then how are we utilizing that to achieve um, our FDI goals? 
we oftentimes map out connections that we have in the market. So we'll look at um, our business leaders and what boards they sit on. And is it possible for us to leverage some of those connections that we have? We oftentimes look at alumni networks and are there particular uh, leaders from alumni that came through that are now in high ranking positions in companies around the world that would be of interest and how do we connect with them? Because we, we know if they've already been here in Columbus and they've studied, they generally will have an affinity um, towards this area. So how do we move that conversation forward? Um, we also are partnering more with uh, organizations like Sister Cities. And so uh, we sit on the Sister Cities board so we can coordinate any outreach that they're doing and have input into that. If they're traveling, we're oftentimes incorporating economic development activities into their missions. And it's now become economic development is a major criteria for their evaluation of bringing on additional cities. So we really try to pull some of those unusual uh, connections into the to our world to see if we can have that outreach of people who are maybe already familiar that is a warm call instead of a, a cold call in many cases. And what you describe, and you said the word like map out, um, identifying the existing connections and how to harness it, this requires data. And it does. I mentioned earlier, and, and I'm thanking this to a great question that was submitted uh, by the audience, uh, developing again, an investment strategy that is proactive, targeted, requires a lot of good, timely and local data. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems that- uh, very I was gonna say that we, we do provide those data. We do provide cluster mapping data for like different you know, parts of the United States where different industries are located. And so that's part of the services and data we provide. We have a ton of data. So if, if for instance, for Ohio or Michigan or the Midwest, um, if you wanted like data in terms of like what, you know, pharmaceutical industries, you know, I, I guess Boston has um, a lot of life sciences. We have data that covers all of those industries that we provide for cities and state. So you just have to reach out and we can provide you a customized report just so you know what's going on. And this cluster mapping data that, uh, that your team provides uh, is tremendously helpful to help narrow down the uh, industry specialization. Uh, that's one part of the picture. The other is actual FDI data, uh, inward FDI data that can tell a city, well, these are the three countries that are investing the most in our jurisdiction or the one of our neighbors. These are the countries that matter the most for these sectors that we're trying to get. But it seems that this FDI data at the local level is sometimes lacking and not all US cities are tracking and measuring these. And uh, Chris, I'd like to, to start with you. I mean, obviously uh, your team is tracking this kind of data. Uh, how, what advice would you give uh, U.S. cities about one the importance of tracking this um, like foreign business, uh, foreign owned businesses locally, or these sort of inward incoming FDI investment by by regions. So not just important, but also how they can do it and, and what kind of dialogue it requires with the business community. Yeah, well, uh, I'll start with the the importance of it and. I'm not going into a sales pitch about what we do. I'm talking about why you need this data, right? Because we've already mentioned about how important retention and expansion is. If you don't know the companies, how can you offer your services to them? So it's a very basic, um, you can't do that without knowing the companies. Secondly, you know, if you look at the, the next thing when you're, you're telling a story is your rankings. So rankings have to use data. And, and rankings tend to go to cities and say, what, what's your data like? And if you can't give that story, your city isn't going to be fully represented like other cities data wise, which means when you look at rankings, uh, absolutely, this is a flaw of rankings, but it means automatically you won't be as high in the rankings because you don't have the data. So it's really important. And, you know, what should a city do? Well, firstly, they have to have a CRM, you know, without a CRM, you know, we, we always say if it's not the CRM, it didn't happen. So you need to get something in your CRM because then you can record it um, and then you can have your KPIs. Usually KPIs and FDI are either project numbers, capital expenditure, jobs creation over a certain value or project numbers. 
th those are the typical four KPIs you'll be looking at. So make sure you're tracking it by that. But one other thing, which, you know, when we look at data, I, I just wanted to touch on, because I think it's important for cities, and this is as someone who sits outside the United States, it is generally, we have found that US economic development organizations have slightly less well-developed value propositions than they do in Europe. And, and, and our belief behind that is, well, traditionally, you know, you don't need to sell where Boston is. Everyone knows where Boston is because you do so much domestic investment. But internationally, we're having to go to that next level. And I think there's going to be a huge opportunity for cities on, on this call to develop world-class value propositions that are no longer generic. No longer do we say we're targeting advanced manufacturing or IT services. We need to get with what the real sectors are nowadays, our cybersecurity, our AI, our robotics. We need to go to that granularity of detail. Otherwise, a company will go to somewhere which has that information. And, and by that, we need to know our talent pools, which I think Femi said that there is a lot of that info. We need to know our industry clusters, again, which you can get from Select USA. You need to know all of the research institutes in your region. That, that's key to people. You need to have the infrastructure. If people are working at home, but you don't have 5G, you don't have good internet, well, forget about it for a lot of these tech industries, your sites and properties, your operating costs. And then if you're working in Europe, you're going to need to have some sort of data on ESG requirements. You know, I, I, I don't think you can get away with it now if you're going to be successful in FDI. And, and this is all data which should be achievable, but it should also be on your website. You should be shouting about these things. And, you know, I think that's the next wave. And, and the final thing I will say in terms of data is, again, I'm saying this from working with EDOs doing their job, their lead generation is, some EDOs, you know, aren't able to explain what incentives a company can get in their region. You know, they might say, check out the CHIPS Act, the IRA, but a company really wants you to tell me financially, what am I going to get for what I invest? And can you tell me how I go about getting that? And these are the sorts of data which investors are asking us. We were once asked, um, a company was looking to invest in, in the US. And usually, you know, we went and said, well, here's a list of properties and sites they came back to us and say, I don't need that anymore. I want a list of availability of talent. So just to leave people with that, people are yeah. all looking at talent now. So, and, um, and all of the things Chris mentions are very important. We provide all of those data also. That's why I'm saying it's, we have a lot of data that we're providing. If it's down, even down to the water that has been used, how much water is there? How many roads, pipelines, the employment data, the type of employment, in that area that's available, the cost of housing, cost of rent, um, you know, we provide all of that data. In terms of like FDI data to specific cities and state, we have access to that data also, and we provide it to like um, cities and economic development agencies. And I'll finish with this. We also do help economic development agencies with a toolkit in terms of like helping them improve on how to, to attract foreign direct investments. We do this and uh, we're gonna be engaging with, um, it's IEDC, um, it's, it's pretty much like economic development agency conference that's happening in like a couple of months. We're going to be there. We're going to be doing like a seminar on economic um, development, uh, how economic development agencies can engage with more FDI. And we are going to provide it with a toolkit to make them like more competitive, um, to get things done. So we, uh, we, we, we provide all of this and we're just, uh, we're ready to work with them. They should just reach out all the data Chris talked about. We have it. Max, so is can I jump in just for a minute? And, and add just a couple of points. I, you know, a couple of the points specifically that, that Chris brought up, I think are, are critically important. First of all, understanding who's already there that you can call on, it's, it's yeah. imperative. It's, you just have to be able to do it. Um, the other thing I would say on a data point that's important for communities Money is not infinite, right? We all have to make decisions on where we're going to invest our dollars, uh, for what markets, for what sectors. And so we oftentimes will benchmark ourselves against other areas around the country. Um, we also take a look at what industries are investing into the U.S. Where are we seeing the activity? Where's the disconnect? Is it an area we should be focused on, but maybe haven't? Do we need to adjust some of our strategies? 
And so that we use a lot of that data to inform our decisions on where we're going to utilize our precious dollars um, because they're not unlimited. And, and having the data to, to justify these investment, being able to put a dollar amount around, okay, this is, this is the outcome of our initial engagement seems to be also a critically important uh, tool, again, to communicate about the value of, of going global to, to constituents and, and taxpayers. Shagun, how, how does your, your team approach the, this question about having the expertise and the data to inform and prioritize Boston strategy? Well, first, I, I think uh, based on this conversation so far, it sounds like we need to contract with Select USA um, on getting <laughs> getting more of the data. Um, I'll, I'll talk with you after, Femi. Um, but, uh, you know, again, not just based on Boston. Uh, however, we do have our research agency uh, under the Boston Planning and Development Agency, which helps us get a lot of um, interesting points about the population here and, and who we should be engaging. But there's an organization called Mass Econ, which does a lot of what Chris has shared and, and Femi um, that helps us understand industry, where folks should be, you know, uh, uh, types of investments uh, that are um, beneficial for the Commonwealth. Um, however, Boston, because I saw the question in the chat as well, and I was happy that you referenced it. We, as a city, have not put out uh, uh, an FDI report. And, however, it's something we would love to to be able to do. And so, you know, I think one of the follow-ups from this call is our team engaging all the panelists here on how Boston, uh, you know, moves up uh, uh, in this space and actually starts producing something of that nature, tracking that would help, you know, everyone else uh, in the region. Um, but but again, it's all based on our relationships um, and our partnerships. Um, one last question before before we end that also was brought up to our attention, something that we need to address is a bit of a pivot. Uh, the relationship with China, uh, it is a relationship that is fraught with tensions and often approached through the lens of great competition, but we're also hearing that many U.S. cities are uh, dependent on, on their economic connections with Chinese counterparts. They have important diasporas from China as well. And, and how do U.S. cities can uh, balance their approach by engaging with China, but still guarding against the risk inherent with this relationship? And maybe I can start with Chris just in one minute and, and maybe then Deb, um, if you could share your perspective on this. Yeah, well, I'll... I'll... Deb can talk about the what you should do. I'll, I'll just lay out, you know, there are obviously geopolitical things that we play, we all need to look at. But if we look at facts, right, China is an $18 trillion economy. So Japan, Germany, UK, India, and France combined are not the size of China. And so it's hard for us to, to ignore, right? So it's the third biggest export market for US companies after Canada and Mexico. Um, until a few years ago, it was a number one FDI player into the United States. Following the pandemic and, and some of the, the, the things going on now, that, that has decreased. But there are still Chinese companies setting up in the United States and within Europe. You know, the World Bank predicts China becomes the, the world's biggest economy in 2035. Goldman Sachs say it will be 2041. So in my mind, you know, economic developers you can't just ignore it. You don't have to be fully engaged, but it has to be on your radar that there will be certain industries that you want to get involved in and certain you don't. Then you, you'll move on to, well, when we find the company, what do we do? I'll, I'll, I think Deb can talk better than I can about that, but my opinion is everyone should have their eye on it because you know, as they often say, politics is short-term, business is long-term. So in, in 10 years time, we might not be in the same place now, but if if you've taken your eye off a location at this time, it's hard to come back in 10 years because you'll be behind the, the, the queue. Deb, closing remarks on this point. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just comment that, you know, we take, uh, we do due diligence on any uh, company that is looking to invest in, in the state of Ohio. They put their, go through a process. Um, we help in those, those aspects, but understanding shareholders, uh, organizational structure, where the money is coming from, um, whether they're, you know, check the U.S. Department of Commerce uh, list. There's several lists to check with Treasury Commerce on are they, you know, making sure that they're not bad actors, uh, critically important. Um, so utilize those resources. And, and if the due diligence checks out, um, 
you know, we have a, a different comfort level in moving forward with working with those organizations. And so that's really the process we take, making sure that we're dotting the I's and, and crossing the T's. And as Ambassador Shikian mentioned also at the very beginning, this uh, closer dialogue and connection between the federal level and the local level to, to share as well this information and expertise can also uh, help your cities uh, navigate uh, this uh, complex environment. Thank you so much to you three, to you four for joining us uh, in this panel. And thank you all for joining this event. We're really thrilled uh, to host this conversation in partnership with the US State Department. Please do stay in touch. Uh, we are, um, City Department will host a series of webinars on the topic of city and state diplomacy. And our team at the Truman Center uh, is releasing regularly uh, different tools and reports on the topic. Um, again, thank you for your time. Thank you for joining and have a good rest of the day.